And so verse 17 of Philippians chapter 4 says, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Lord, that is a, that's a mouthful. Lord, you do say in your word, in the Psalms, you say, open your mouth wide, I will fill it. Well, you fill it, you filled it, Lord. Now, please speak to us. What does this mean? Lord, your, your word says that um, your word is for our building up. It's for our cleansing, it's for our healing, it's for our strength. Strengthen us, strengthen us, Lord, in the name of Jesus, by your word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, you may be seated. Okay, Philippians chapter 3. Again, at the beginning of this chapter, Paul is letting them know who he was prior to becoming a Christian, prior to his encounter with Christ. He says in, he says in verse 5, I was circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. So what that really means is he was the real thing. He goes, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, uh, 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 the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is of the law, blameless. He was a he had it all when, the, uh, when the, the, the society, the city, or the community was looking at him, they would say, wow, this guy has it all. But he says there in verse 8, I counted it all rubbish so that, verse 10, I could know Jesus Christ, so that I could know the power of his resurrection so that I could know the fellowship of his sufferings, so that I could be conformed to his death. He understood that his pride in in, in who he was, in his race and in his religion, it was all like rubbish. And what God wanted to bring to him was a relationship with the living God. That's what um, he discovered. And so, Um, He goes on to say, we were in it last week, verse 12, not that I have already arrived or am already perfected, meaning I'm still getting to know Jesus Christ, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his stuff. I'm still there. I'm not there yet. But But he says, but I press on. He says it again in verse 14, I press on. On. And we uh, talked about that word press last week. In the Greek, it is the word persecute. In fact, when it is translated to English, 35 of the 43 times this word is used, it's the word 
persecute, which means to trouble and harass. So what he's saying is that I counted everything that I thought was important, rubbish, some translations say dung, so that I could um, harass God to trouble him, to, 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 to go after him, to strive. To, it's another thing that he says is to stretch forward, seeking him, seeking to know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. But, and by that, he um, meant that you know, Jesus Christ, uh, he, was, he was isolated, he was mocked, he was betrayed, And he's literally saying, I want to know Jesus in the fellowship of that same thing that happened to him. I know it happens to me. And he realized there was a kinship, a brotherhood, a fellowship with Jesus in that suffering. And some of you in here have discovered just the blessedness of that. Getting to know your God in the fellowship fellowship of his sufferings. It was just in Matthew 26 this morning, and I noticed when Jesus was at the Garden of Gethsemane with, all, with the, the, the disciples, he had, he had asked them to stay awake. Uh, they didn't. But he, said, but he came to them after praying three times and he said, rise, let us be, he said, rise, let us be going. He actually intended for them to go with him to trial. They would be watching the trial as he was tried. But what happened? It says every single one of them fled. He said, let us be going. But they fled. So he knows what it's like to be left a alone. And you guys do too. But don't forsake the opportunity to get to know Jesus in the fellowship of his sufferings. And so we come to verse 17, and he says this, brethren, join in following my example. Now, I will tell you that in my early years of being a Christian, I did not have many people uh, that I even knew who were living out verse 10 of chapter 3, where Paul says, when he sa- by the way, when he says, follow my example, he means troubling, harassing, pressing, stretching forward, getting to know God in the fellowship of the resurrection power fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Jesus walked through every temptation. He he died unto himself. He was conformed to his death. Paul is saying, follow my example as I do this. And in the first number of years of my Christian life, I um, did not really know too many people at all, too many Christians um, who lived that out who had a passion just to know God, to seek him, no matter how much it hurt. I I really, I didn't know too many of these people at all with a great desire, people of whom it could be said that they troubled and harassed God. They didn't settle for anything less than to know God. People who, who, who sought God out, remember Don't forget, so important, why did Paul seek God with such intensity? Why did he? Why did he seek with such intensity to know the power, his fellowship of his sufferings, and and, and to, to be conformed to his death? Why did he do that? What was his motive? Anyone want to shout it out? It's a three letter word joy. First verse of the chapter. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. What brought him joy? It was with intensity, seeking to know God and his resurrection power and even knowing him in the fellowship. And I personally knew very few of these people. Today, I'm surrounded by them (laughs) at Calvary Chapel in the city. And it is, it, it is such a blessing. 
But it's important for you to, uh, to, to understand. He says, attach yourself to me. Follow my example. Listen, if you're in here, and some of you, um, some of you, this, this, is you, this is who you are. You're a lone ranger. You're out there living the Christian life by yourself. You haven't attached yourself to anybody. Paul says, follow me, follow me, cling to me, follow my example. Don't be a lone ranger. Calvary Chapel, don't do that. Me, myself, and Jesus, the Lord has never, and never, he never has and he never will prosper that kind of life. There are many among in this room who you can latch on to as an example. But Paul says here, follow my example. Follow my example. Find someone who is an example of Jesus Christ and latch yourself on to them. And, and, and better yet, be an example. <laughs> be an, become one of those men or women um, who uh, has this glorious calling in, in, in their life. Listen, there's no calling more glorious in a life than to be an example of Philippians 3.10, an example of someone who just wants to know God, who considers everything else dung, rubbish, to get to know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, to be conformed to his image, to, to become an example to others. How many of you were, were like, man, I just want to get, um, get up into the business world to just to be a mentor to other people who want to strive and do well in business? Well, that's great. But I can tell you, and, 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 and don't stop doing that, but a far better, holy, glorious, joy-filled, joy-filled, joy-filled calling is to, is to seek the Lord in the power of his resurrection, getting to know him and becoming an example to others who want to have that same joy. Best, most glorious calling that you could possibly have in your life. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, make disciples of all nations. He says, go out, live that life and have people attach themselves to you. So again, it says in verse 18 for rather, it says in, Verse 17, uh, join in following my example. Note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Verse 18, for many, says many, walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. So it says many walk this way. Many walk. Who are these people? He's warning them of people who he, sa he says, even with weeping, he's saying, be careful of these people. <coughs> Go away from these people. Separate from these people. But who are they? Turn with me to Matthew 13. And we'll, and because Jesus gives the answer in Matthew 13. That's to the left about 100 pages first book of the New Testament, chapter 13. Best way to interpret the Bible is with the Bible. Everyone there, Matthew 13, verse 24. This is Jesus speaking. In verse 24 of Matthew 13, another parable he put forth to them, says the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. 
And while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And the servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into the barn. And so, when Paul says, beware of those whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, he's talking about people in church, in Christian circles, who they walk the walk, they sort of from a distance, they look like Christians, but they're not. And he says, with weeping, I tell you, they walk as enemies of the cross. They walk as enemies of the cross. Why? Because speaking of latching on, what happens is believers in Christ who do not really know the Bible or who are weaker will also be drawn away by them. They'll be looking at them like, okay, well, whatever. And they'll, they, they, they will be drawn away. So these are men and women who, they, they're in and out of churches. They like the vibe. They like the scene. They like the high fives after a good worship song. They can talk the talk. They can walk, but, but they can't, they don't, they don't walk the walk. And when they leave church, it becomes really clear who they are. Tears. A tear, Jesus said, there's wheat, and then some, someone planted tares. Tares looked just like wheat from afar. But man, you try to eat a tear, you'd be spitting that thing out. It's like bitter. It's not wheat. And, 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 and so Paul says, their end, these people, um, Jesus, their God is not Jesus Christ It's their belly, he says. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Now, what does that mean? It means they never deny their belly, ever. So if if their belly wants an ice cream sundae, their belly will get the ice cream sundae. If their belly wants a cherry pie, their belly will get a cherry pie. If their belly wants a ribeye steak, they will get a ribeye steak. They never deny their belly. But the idea here is, of course, it's not just their belly. Whatever they crave, they take it. If they crave a man, they take a man. If they crave a woman, they take that woman. If they crave a dress, a suit, a shoes, a $400 hair salon visit, a car, whatever, I'm not talking about things they need. I'm talking about things they crave, they take it. Why? Because their God is their belly. But they know the Christian thing. They know how to, to, to talk. They know sort of how to belay, behave when they're at church. But they leave church, God is their belly. We drink, vape, the worst kind of music, worst kind of video games, worst kind of company. They just, they go for it because they crave it. When it comes to sin, listen, there's no battle. There's no battle at all when it comes to sin. You guys remember the book of Galatians? Uh, This verse from the book of Galatians, it, it puts a lot of stuff in perspective, I tell you. For the flesh... That means your sinful nature, lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another. Meaning, in a real born again Christian, there is a battle. There's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. 
And I g- 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 praise the Lord for Roman, the last verse of the book of uh, Romans, chapter 7. Who's, who can rescue me from this battle? And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. But, but there's a battle. But what I'm talking about here, Paul's warning people whose God is their belly. There is no battle. There's no battle at all. And he says, even with tears, he is, he is warning them against these people. These people, they don't get off on God. They get off on sin. They put up with a, a, church, a church well enough, but the, their glory is in their sin. What is shameful? It says their glory is in their shame. He says they war, he, he, he warns them with tears, it says. And then it, it goes on in verse 19, and it says, who set their mind on earthly things. And I tell you, I worry about this stuff all the time. You wanna, you wanna know what the life of a pastor is? It's this. It's carnality at Calvary Chapel in the city. People attaching themselves to other Christians who their God is their belly. That's what, that's what I worry about. He says, Pastor Steve, you're not supposed to worry. I know, pray for me. He says, I warn you with tears. Calvary Chapel, listen, if you've attached yourself to this kind of person, you need to detach. You say, but that seems so unloving. Only if you detach yourself without explaining to them why. So if you like ghost them, you don't answer text, you just stop, oh, well, Pastor Steve says, I'm not supposed to be hanging out with this, this woman. Uh, you stop answering texts and phone calls. That's not, that's not loving. But what is loving is telling them why. Because as the verse says there in verse 19, their end is destruction. The most loving thing to tell someone whose end is destruction is I can't hang with you anymore because it looks like you're, you glory in your sin. There's, and there's no battle. And I'm too weak to be hanging out with you. Let me tell you, there's not a single person in this room, including me, especially me, who's so strong they can hang out with a person whose God is their belly. You need to detach yourself from them. Well, what if they get angry at me? Well, they will. (laughs) But Jesus said this, and this is Jesus speaking. He said, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. Do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be, uh, be those of his own household. Now, this would include friends as well. You need to detach yourself from people who are in and out of churches calling themselves Christians but their God is their belly. They're, not in, they're in no battle between the flesh and the spirit. They're just uh, doing what they want to do. Now, um, that's a super serious business. You, we are told multiple times, separate yourself. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, it says this, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother, meaning anyone who is a Christian who is sexual and moral, covetous, meaning the kind of person who's like, when you're around them, like they're in church, they call themselves a Christian, but they're just always talking about what they want. You know what I want? I, I want this. You know, I really want that. I really want. Do you want Jesus, dude? I mean, where's Jesus in all this wanting? It says separate yourself. That's a covetous person. Or who is an idolater, a reviler, meaning someone who's always criticizing and, 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 and um, someone who's always criticizing people and insulting people, or a drunkard or an extortioner. No, don't even eat with such a person. Now notice here, it says, it says, 
don't keep company with anyone named a brother. The next verse is, I'm not talking about people who are not Christians. Of course, people who are not Christians, they're sexual, immoral, immoral covetous, idolatry, idolaters, and drunkards. I'm not talking about them. You'd have to leave the world um, if, if you cut yourself off from those people. That's what he says in the next verse. Read it, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, a great, a great chapter. But he says, if someone is, calls themselves a Christian, separate. Separate from them. Now, before I move on, I do need to say this. Listen, (laughs) in a group of this size, chances are you're one of these people who God is your belly. There's at least one or two of you in here. Your God's your belly. Your glory is in your shame. There's no battle between you with temptation. You just do it. Whatever it is, you just do it. Verse 19 says, your end is destruction. Now that's a reference to hell. And I have to say this to you. Jesus Christ loves you. He loves you. But he hates your sin. And if you want a picture of how much Jesus Christ hates your sin, close your eyes and picture a man fastened to a cross with iron spikes and he's beaten beyond recognition. Doesn't even look human. That's how much God hates sin. That's how much Jesus Christ hates your sin. He went through that to take away your sin, to put it away. Dan talked about in the worship set, just the blood pays for, purges, puts away sin. Hebrews chapter nine. Again, I'm talking to you who's God, your God is your belly. I mean, t- I'll tell you, God, that's sin, that's a sinful lifestyle, God hates your sin, says Jesus Christ, I'm speaking to you, but now once at the end of the ages, he, Jesus, has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He didn't sacrifice himself for you to keep your sin. He, he, He sacrificed to put it away. Your sin is destroying you. It's paving your way to hell. So please, it's so so important to understand when the Bible describes God's love for you, it says he suffers long with you and your sin. So don't mistake God's suffering a real long time or just letting you continue in your sin, don't mistake that for the fact that he hates your sin and he wants you to repent. Mark chapter one, verse 15 says, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. This is Jesus' first words out of his mouth as a public minister, as a public figure. He said, repent and believe the good news. So let's go on. Verse 20 says, for our citizenship is in heaven. For our citizenship is in heaven. Again, when Jesus first made an appearance in public, the first thing he did was he called he called man and woman to a different kingdom. Here again, here's the same verse. After John, John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. These are his first words in public, as a public figure. So when you repent, when you turn from your sin into God, when you believe who Jesus is, that he, the son of God, came to live for you, to die for you, to raise from the dead for you, to save you from judgment for your, uh, from your sins and, and, and to save you from death and hell, the Bible says that when you repent and you believe, God takes you from one kingdom and puts you in a completely different one. 
It says in uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, He has saved us from the kingdom of darkness, and he has brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. You are now in the kingdom of the son he loves, and you are a citizen of the, that kingdom. You're no longer, you were a citizen of the kingdom of darkness, and now you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the son of his love, Colossians 1 verse 13 says. And the thing about, there's a big difference uh, between, a big difference between the kingdom of darkness uh, and the kingdom of the son of his love. And I could, or there could be 40 sermons about that. But, but, but in the kingdom of darkness, all the king wants to do, and the king is the devil. Remember the devil took Jesus up to the uh, top of the temple, looked at um, all the kingdoms. He said, bow down and, and I'll give you all these kingdoms. And Jesus said, uh, the Bible says that worship the Lord God and serve him only. Get away from me, Satan. But, but the, all the kingdom of darkness wants to do is take from you. Take and take and take and take. All God wants to do is give to you. Give and give and give and give. I was talking to a young man yesterday. He spent the last 10 years in the tech world going from tech company to tech company to tech company. And in the middle of the conversation, this is the first conversation I've ever had with this guy in my life. In the middle of the conversation, he looks and says, I'm sure you can tell just talking with me that I'm traumatized because of what I went through um, in the tech world in the last 10 years. He said that very early on, he got the money that he wanted, but time and time he was used, abused, chewed up, spit out. There was no sense anywhere that anyone was trying to build a relationship of trust with him. Take, 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 take. Now, I'm not saying for one second you should, I, I worked for a gigantic company of 40,000 people, and I'm very thankful for them. I was greatly blessed and thankful to the day for the family who owns the company. And, and we should never be those Christians, oh, the world is so cursing, so evil and wicked, look at them, and we're over here. No, I'm not, not, it's not what I'm saying, but what I am saying is this. In the world, they just want to take and take and take and take from you because that's what the devil is. That's what he wants to do. He came to, he came to steal, kill, and destroy. God, on the other hand, all he wants to do is give to you. Give and give and give and give. And those of you who are fathers and mothers, you know what I mean. I mean, if I could have, I would have given my son Sam a a car when he was seven years old. Now, I know that wasn't a good, yeah, I had to wait, but, but you just want to do that, to lavish, and, and God just wants to lavish on you. Moses said, who are you, God? And he responded in Exodus 34. He said he passed before him, and he told him who he was. This is who I am, Moses. The Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and a Abounding in goodness and truth. Abounding. Think of a fountain just overflowing. Abounding. This is who God is. He just wants to give all this to you. He has a heart to give to you. He said, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving the iniquity and transgression and sin, but by no means I'm clearing the guilty. First Chronicles chapter 28 verse, um, 28 verse uh, uh, 9, King David speaking to Solomon he said, listen, if you seek God, can we keep that up, John? First Chronicles 28 and 9, David said to Solomon, if you seek God, you will be found by him. And I'm telling you, Calvary Chapel, if you seek God, just counting everything rubbish, and just harassing him and troubling him. And just like Jesus would have said with the widow who wouldn't let the, um, who just nagged and nagged and nagged that unjust judge until she got what it, if you, if you just pursue God with that kind of intensity, I will tell you 
100% certain this is what you're going to find. You're going to find a God who just wants to give you grace, give you goodness, and fill you up with mercy and truth. That's who God is. And you're a citizen of that kingdom. You're a citizen of that kingdom. Can we have Colossians again, John? Again, it says that when you were saved, you may have not realized you were being transported. But it says that God transferred you, saved us. He saved us from the kingdom of darkness, and he has brought us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And you now are a citizen of that kingdom. That means you take your instructions from God. You don't take your instructions from your belly. You don't take your instructions from the world. You don't take your instructions from the devil. You take your instructions from God. You're a citizen of heaven, the Bible says. Of course, right here. These are the instructions. The Holy Spirit will bring these instructions and place them on your heart and, and, and will add things from time to time that, that he wants you to do, go to the right or the left or back, backwards or shut your mouth or talk or whatever, but, but um, um, he will give you the instructions. So again, verse um, um, 20 says, um, it says, for our citizenship is in heaven. Then it says, from which we also... Eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, which according to the working, uh, rather, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So here we're told that a citizen of heaven is to Eagerly wait for the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, in 9.30 a.m. prayer this morning, I invite all of you to it. It's my favorite time every week. I had to ask the Lord for forgiveness because I don't emphasize this enough. That being a Christian means eagerly waiting on the return of Jesus Christ. I, don't, I do not emphasize that enough, but, but listen to me. Um, if you compare Bible verses on, if you, if you line up Bible verses, at least in the New Testament, of, of seeing Jesus when you die, and put that up against seeing Jesus upon his return, the verses about seeing Jesus on his return outnumber the verses about seeing Jesus when you die. I think it's like 10 to 1. And yet, don't we talk about seeing Jesus when we die mostly? At least I do. I'm guilty of that. And that's why I had to ask the Lord for forgiveness You're going to see Jesus when you die. Daryl Nelson, who did our men's retreat about five or six years today, years ago, his wife Amy did the women's retreat right after the men's retreat. Daryl died yesterday. He's with the Lord now. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7 says that though you see, now you see as in a mirror in a dark room, when you die, you'll see him face to face. He was such a wonderful guy. But I am jealous. He's with the Savior face to face. The Bible does teach that you see Jesus when you die. But I'm telling you, there are far more verses that tell us to eagerly wait Jesus' return and talk about the hope of seeing Jesus on his return. And these are two of the verses. Again, middle of verse 20, it says, it says our, our citizenship is in heaven for which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says in verse 21, 
who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So he's going to give you a new body. And it says it's going to be like his body is what he says there. Now, that word lowly body there, verse 21, if you go into the Greek and you do the study, what it really means is it, it's the word humiliation. It's a body of humiliation. Some of your translations probably say that. He will take your bodies of humiliation and it says, and conform them to his glorious body. I don't know about you, but as I, as, as I studied that and thought about that, that is a good description of my body. It's, it's a body of humiliation. Genesis chapter 3, when, when Adam and Eve decided they wanted to be like God, remember Satan approached Eve, says, you, you can be like God. She took the bait, she ate it, gave it to her husband. He ate. It says that death brought about sin, and sin overtook them and began its work, sin and death. And so what followed was physical corruption, disease, pain, weakness, all of which invaded the human DNA, and was passed from generation to generation right up to you and me, but it also invaded this and, and caused spiritual corruption and inclination to rebel against God, an inclination to say, no, I am like God. I just saw yesterday walking around Boston, it says, you are, there was some graffiti rather, you are gods, that's what we're taught, you, you are gods. And that came from that corruption that originally happened um, in, the, uh, in the garden. And, and so, but that sin over time, it's created bodies of humiliation. Sin over time has had a humiliating effect on our bodies and on our minds. Uh, you know, Genesis chapter 2 says on the sixth day of creation, God said, let us make man in our image. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. But uh, your sin, the sin you inherited, and the sin you commit, and the sin that has been done to you has corrupted you and has humiliated the image of God in you. We now have bodies of humiliation. And I think, wow. That body now, it's just so easy to anger. It's, that body is so easy to fear. That body so easy to lust. That body so easy to worry. I was reading uh, John Newton, the guy who wrote Amazing Grace. Just an incredibly godly man. He went from a slave trader to a guy who wrote the song. It's probably been played more than any other song, spiritual, secular, in the history of the world. Amazing grace. And, and, and he, speaking of his body of humiliation, he said, my mind has, it's like it has no borders. Just the most ugliest, terrible thoughts just go right in. There's no borders. And he's just thanking God for the blood but that's what it means to have a body of humiliation. <laughs> and, it, and it says there, it says that he will transform, it says, citizens of heaven, verse 20, eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform your lowly body, your body of humiliation, and have it be conformed to his glorious body. So in Luke chapter 22, you don't have to turn there, but after Jesus' resurrection, it says they were all hiding, the disciples were all hiding, the 11 apostles, Judas had hung himself. And in verse, verse 36 of Luke, Luke 24, it says, as they were talking, it says, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you.
And then it says, but they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a ghost. And so Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? And why do you doubt in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And, but while they still did not believe, for joy they marveled. Jesus said, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb. And so he was proving to him, like a spirit, a ghost doesn't like eat, eat honey. A ghost doesn't eat broiled fish. He had a glorified body. Jesus had a glorified body. And it says that as a citizen of heaven, Philippians 3.20, we are to eagerly await, and if we don't have that eagerness in us, we ask God for it. We eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body so that it may be conformed to his glorious body. And so that is an incredible hope. I mean, I don't know about you, but every day, I am just so acutely aware of how weak I am. Just, you know, how, how, how the mind just starts to uh, fall apart. How quick to fear, to get angry, to lust, to worry. And so when I'm reminded of this, and I think, wow, I really, really don't teach on this enough. Forgive me, Lord, because how I want, how I long to be in a glorified body. And as a citizen of the kingdom of God, you, you have that hope. I'm going to ask the... the uh, Worship team to come up at this time if you've been asked to pray. Please come up at this time. First John chapter three, verse two. Do we have that, John? It says this, beloved. He's speaking to you. This is God speaking to you. He's calling you beloved. Now we are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's 1 John 3, 2. What a hope. What a privilege to be in the kingdom, a citizen of the kingdom. If you could stand up at this time, we're going to close with a worship song. And if you have had just a stirring in your heart of, of whatever kind, you know, we've covered a lot of ground today. Perhaps there's a person in your life who you know, they call themselves a Christian, but their God is their belly. And you're figuring out, what do I do? Come up, we'll pray about it. We'll pray for wisdom. Those are about the hardest situations in life. Of what do I do with this situation? Or maybe you're thinking, wow, there, is my God my belly? I mean, is there any battle at all with, with sin? I just seem to... I just seem to run into whatever I'm craving. Come up, let's pray about it. Let's pray about that. Or if you just want the Lord to stir in your heart, 
that eagerness for his return or you will get a brand new glorious body and you just want to pray for that or whatever else you might want to have prayer for you can come up at this time Father we thank you for this word thank you for taking us through this glorious book thank you for filling us with your word and Lord we want to go out and we want to apply it we don't want to be of whom it is said people who hear the word but do not do the word as every word that has been mentioned today Lord I'm supposed to do and all of us are Lord but that can only happen it can only happen with you Lord because we're weak we live in tents and bodies of <laughs> of humiliation but your word says that when we acknowledge our weakness we can be mighty strong in the spirit so Lord as we finish out this service help us worship help us pray in Jesus name Amen